Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Welcome to GitHub Satellite. It's so amazing to be here today. Um, this has been a, a long journey for a lot of people. A lot of hard work has gone into this. So before we begin talking about what's up, what we've been working on, um, what's coming for the few couple days that we have together, I really just wanted to start with a huge shout out to the GitHub events team, to, to Kelsey, to Chris Kelly, to Drew, to Brittany, to everyone that helped put this thing together. Thank you so much, GitHub events team. This is really amazing. So this is me. There's some cool animations. So there's a lot of cool stuff happening. Um, if this is your first time joining us, welcome. If this is uh, your second time, if you were here for GitHub Satellite in Amsterdam last year, welcome back. There's going to be a lot of great sessions today. We've got this stage here. We also have another stage uh, across the way over there. Um, check out the website. Check out the, uh, the, the lineup. There's going to be a lot of great talks. Don't miss the closing keynote tonight. We're going to be talking a lot about um, GitHub as an open platform for education. You can learn a little bit about Raspberry Pi and some of the things people are doing with that. And uh, certainly don't miss the Ask GitHub section if you haven't seen it yet. So right across uh, the way here, there's a, big, there's a big area with chairs and tables, and it's called Ask GitHub. And this started for us as like a single little booth where we kind of had some support people, some salespeople, and you could come, you could chat with them, ask them questions. Turns out people like that, and we like it too. So we've really grown it. And now we have support, we have sales, we have a bunch of different groups that are out there, people that work for GitHub. Go say hello, go talk to them, go ask questions. And we also have, um, as I mentioned, our support team here. So we're doing a little bit of a survey, a community survey, to try to help shape the future of our own support and figure out like, what do you all want, what do you all need, um, you know, how can we do better at support, and particularly if you're here, what are your needs and what are some things we're maybe not thinking about. So if you could go over there, hang out with the support team, take the survey, we would really appreciate that because we're here, yes, to talk about software, yes, to talk about the future, but we're also here to listen and to get your feedback. Also tonight, there is a, uh, I'm told there's a party. So there's an uh, event at the Hawker House, which as you can see from the illustration, is a block next to the block we're in. But yeah, it's a short walk away. Uh, please join us, it's gonna be pretty fun. Also, thank you to our sponsors. Obviously, this is a GitHub produced event, but you're here. Um, there's a lot of different people that are involved in making this happen inside GitHub and outside GitHub. And so uh, you can go out to the courtyard. You can see some of the fine food that our sponsors have helped us sort of curate. You can also go into the main area over there and see some of the booths and some of the things like that. So huge thank you to all of our sponsors. Uh, if you haven't checked out any of these companies yet, there's going to be people here that can answer your questions and talk to you about them. They're all pretty great. And if you're building any sort of software, you could find a use for all these things in what you're doing. So we wanted to talk a little bit today about like, what is the point of this event? What is the point of, let's say, GitHub? Where are we going? And a little bit around how do we think about the future? How do we think about GitHub itself? And so lately, we've been talking a lot about this idea of an open ecosystem, as you can see from the slide. So it has to be true, because it's up on the screen. But what we mean by this is really this idea of when GitHub started, Git already existed. It was an open source project. And I was a big fan of Git. My co-founders were big fans of Git. But we found it a little bit difficult to use and to share code with other people. And so that's really where GitHub came from, is we wanted an easier, more approachable way to share code and work with others. And we were big open source fans, but we were also really forced into this world of Git because it was already there. And by that I mean immediately we had people that were using the site that were using Windows, they were using Linux, they were using Mac, because Git itself had so many different clients, so many different options, so many different ways to interact with it and use the protocol, GitHub was sort of grandfathered into that. Is we inherited this, this really great ecosystem and we immediately became a part of it without really doing much. And so over the past nine years, because um, GitHub actually just turned nine in April, which is pretty amazing. But over the past nine years, we've tried to embrace this fact. I mean, we are first and foremost a company that's for developers and was started by developers. And so there's a lot of philosophies we've learned through building software that we wanted to carry forward. But also, we just think this is a huge advantage to us, is that if we can be a part of this ecosystem, you know, if we can help lift up the Git community and help participate and make software development better for our peers, for even some of our competitors, we think it'll actually be better for all of us. And so we've always really been into this idea of an ecosystem in which not every part is owned by one company, but all the parts work really well together. And they're all owned and they're all produced by 
individuals, um, startups, big companies, small companies, the whole gamut. And so today we want to talk a little bit about how we're embracing this and how we're planning to move forward working better with you all and with some of our uh, partners. So these are some of our numbers. You can see that they are numbers. Um, but they're pretty cool, right? So when GitHub started, there was only a couple people using it. And really, we thought the market or the opportunity for Git were a couple thousand people who wanted to build software in a weird way and were like creepily into cats, I guess. Uh, turned out a lot of people really like cartoon cats, and a lot of people really like Git. And so we can see there's over 21 million people using GitHub every day with, with authenticated accounts. This is not to say anything of the people that are logged out. And what they're working on are, as you know, millions and millions of projects, which we're really proud of. But I think a lot of websites or companies would use a stat like this to show their own success. And yeah, GitHub is really big. And it's, been, it's bigger than we could have ever hoped for. And for that, it's, it's like amazing. But when I look at these numbers, I don't think that this is necessarily a product of, of, of GitHub success. This is not me sharing with you how the company has been doing and rah, rah. This goes to show that we're part of something that's really massive. Like I, we see reports, I see reports of how many software developers there are in the world. And it's from companies that are paid to do research and they try to figure out how many jobs there are that are classified as developers and, and this and that. And they come out with a number. And the we'll, number we hear often is 20 million developers. We hear there are 20 million professional developers in the world. So we have 21 million people using GitHub. And so either there are more people on GitHub than there are developers in the world, which I refuse to believe, or we, we, we really don't know what's going on out there. And I think that's actually closer to the truth, is our classical definition of a software developer is changing. A lot of the jobs are changing. A lot of the work is changing. And I, I think probably if there's ever a reason or a platform in which to say you're preaching to the choir, this is it right now. But it's real, right? Like our numbers are bigger than the numbers that we're being told represent the entire industry. And while I think GitHub is a really big deal, no one thinks GitHub is the entire industry. So software development is still growing. And it's still kind of hard to understand. It's growing at a very rapid rate. And we don't all really understand or see every piece of it. And to me, that's exciting. To me, that says that there's a lot of opportunity there for software developers, for companies. Um, but what's more exciting to me is what's going to come out of that. What are the projects people are going to make? What are the innovations people are going to come up with? What is the technology that someone's going to invent that so maybe someone here, maybe someone that's not here, that we can't even imagine today? To me, that's the most exciting part about GitHub. And really, that all comes from the community. And it comes from people working together to build cool stuff. And when you have 20 million people, uh, a lot of cool stuff tends to come out of that. So a part of that is, is tied into our philosophy. We call it meeting you where you are. But we've always wanted GitHub to feel like whatever tools you use, whatever operating environment you're working in, whatever sort of uh, developer you are, we want it to feel like GitHub works for you. If you're a Windows developer building c Stripe applications, we want GitHub to work really well in your Visual Studio environment. If you're using Linux and you're all in Vim and you're just using the terminal, we want that to be a very premier experience for me. We want it to feel like very first class. And if you're somewhere else, if you're using a Mac and you want to use a GUI client and maybe you're writing a lot of a Python or something, we want you to feel like GitHub is there for you and it, and it really integrates into your workflow. And this is a lot of what we mean when we talk about an open ecosystem. So why are we here today? Well, GitHub is a lot of things. And one of them, like I said, is the community. And we're not just in the United States. We're not just in North America. GitHub is very much a global community. And one of the reasons that we're here today in Europe is because you're here in Europe, because the community is here in Europe. Over the past year, we've had uh, over 30% growth in, in Europe alone to, um, to our website. So we have tons of big enterprise customers here. There's tons of open source happening here. But Ultimately, you know, just because our headquarters is in San Francisco doesn't mean that that's where a lot of the community is or where a lot of the growth is. And in fact, we see tons of growth from Asia and tons of growth from Europe. So it's super exciting to us to see this sort of like community growing all over the world. But we also have always felt that a big part of GitHub is what's online, what's on the web. But a bigger part of GitHub is um, what's here in reality, what's here in meet space, what's, what's here physically. And so we want to be on the ground meeting with you, talking with you, sort of figuring out where you live and how you like to work so we can start to integrate that back into what we're building. So again, please come talk to us. Please come say hello. Let us know what you're working on and how you like to work, because we know there are a ton of you here in Europe, and there are a ton of people all over the world using GitHub. We want to make it really great for all of them. Also. 
These are our top five countries in Europe. So if you're not in one of these countries, go tell all your friends, right? So these are the most popular uh, European countries used in GitHub today. So there's a lot of opportunity there if you live, I don't know, anyone from Czech, any other countries there? Let's get some more numbers on there. Anyway, um, over the past year, we uh, have certainly been growing geographically, but we've also been trying to embrace this ecosystem idea in more ways than just a, a keynote talk and slides. We've actually been trying to go and figure out what does it really mean to see what someone's environment is like and integrate into it in a way that feels very natural to them. And one place where we know that we've been really missing out over the past nine years is game developers. It's like um, Unity is this massive platform that people are using to build all sorts of mobile games and desktop games today. And so we now have a GitHub integration in Unity, which is pretty awesome. You can check it out. It's available online. But for us, this is an example of people are building software using Unity, and we want their experience on GitHub to feel very natural. We don't want it to be in the way. We don't want it to be a, a hurdle or a barrier. We really want it to be the opposite of that. We want GitHub integration in Unity to unlock doors and to really lower barriers for people. And so if you're a game developer, if you've been playing with Unity, if you're interested in anything like that, we have GitHub integration available now. You can check it out. Uh, it's pretty awesome. If you're not a game developer, if you've never tried this stuff, but if you've ever been interested in games, um, check out Unity. It's a really great framework. It's a great place to start. Um, there's a really great community built around that. We're trying to be a big part of that, and I think it's going pretty well. Similarly, I already kind of mentioned um, C-sharp developers, sort of the Microsoft world. If you've been reading the news lately, you probably have learned that, I guess, Microsoft um, how, how do you say this? I don't know. Microsoft was killed and replaced by a clone who's like much friendlier to open source, I guess, and has very different ideals. It's a very strange transition they've gone through in the past couple years, but it's a whole different company. And uh, they're embracing open source in a very real way. They're embracing Linux. They're part of the Linux Foundation now. And so we've become, we've become great friends with them. And one of the best parts of that is this opportunity for us to sort of understand their ecosystem, their development platform a bit more, and to help make that better. And so now Visual Studio ships with GitHub integration. Uh, you can find it online. We're really excited about it. Visual Studio itself just started recently shipping for Mac. So even if you don't have Windows, you can start participating in the Microsoft ecosystem. And again, this is just an example for us of we want GitHub to come to you. We want it to work where you are. And even if it's in a part of development that hasn't really felt touched or reached out to by GitHub in the past, we're working to, to get in there and make it feel very native. Um, does anyone here use Atom? A couple people? All right, cool, cool. Hello, everyone. Uh, so there's this thing called Atom. It's a hackable text editor for the 21st century. 22nd, I hope, but 21st right now. So Atom for us has always been sort of a... Uh, an ideal. It's this, it's this really amazing piece of technology, but it's also open source. It's also hackable. It also has a community behind it. And we always just thought it was really cool. We always thought it would be something that would be very useful to um, anyone who wanted to be a developer. But we were never kidding ourselves with, I'm sure a lot of people use Vim or Emacs or Sublime. Like an editor is a very personal choice. So we never really launched Atom with the expectation that every hand would be raised. I don't think that there's going to be any developer software ever where everyone uses it. It's kind of one of the awesome parts about development is we all use our own tools and we can modify them and whatnot. And yet Adam's growth and Adam's success has really blown us away. Um, and it kind of reminds me a little bit of, you know, we started GitHub, we wanted some people to use it, and a lot of people used it, and that was amazing. Adam, Adam is a similar story. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the ecosystem, when we talk about meeting you where you are, yeah, it, it does mean a GitHub integration inside Unity. It does mean GitHub integration inside of Visual Studio. But we also want to make the experience of building software approachable and easier. And we want to make that door a little bit more open to everyone. And the way we've always tried to do it is by creating professional tools and making them available to everyone. We have this belief that you don't dumb down the tools for someone. You sort of simplify the content. But you make the professional tools, you make the best tools available to everyone, and you cater the way you talk about it and the way you present it. So we never want to have a training wheels version of software where you have to graduate into the, the real version of the software. We always want everyone, whether they're the beginner that's learning at the very first day or they've been programming for 30 years, to have access to the same power. What we want to do, though, is help um, guide the approach to learning how to use that software or using it. And I think Atom is a great example of that. Atom is a really powerful piece of software. It's very professional. You can use it for all sorts of real development, but it's also really great to just get up and running on. It costs zero dollars. It's open source. A lot of classrooms use it. It's a great educational tool. And if you learn on Atom and you learn a lot of the principles in that text editor, you can definitely switch to something else. 
Um, I think the reality is I have like three text editors in my taskbar, and I don't even code that much anymore. So a lot of people are using more than one text editor, and Atom is a really great place to get your foot in the door. Um, more so than that, the growth is, is, is just been, I mean, I don't even know what to say. It's awesome. Um, at Universe, GitHub Universe, uh, the end of last year, we had just about a million people using Atom, and that was uh, seven or eight months ago. Now we have two million. So in less than a year, we've added more than a million active users to Atom. So if you want to sit here and tell me that there's 20 million developers in the world and 10% of them are using Atom, I'm just going to tell you I don't believe in that. There are so many developers that are just starting today, that are growing into this, that are going into all sorts of jobs and work and using open source and contributing to it. And these numbers just don't lie. There are so many people using Atom. I would love to see these numbers for something like Sublime or Visual Studio Code, because I guarantee you that they're growing a lot too. We're all growing a lot right now because software development is growing, and we still don't really have a firm grasp on what the future of that looks like. That's a little bit of what we want to talk about today. So we also uh, released something uh, recently called uh, GitHub Desktop. So we have Atom, which is a text editor with some really great GitHub integration in it. We also have a standalone client for using GitHub, because our, our dream has always been yeah, we support the Git client. We have people that work on it all the time. We're big fans of it. But if you want a GUI, if you don't want to use the command line um, tool, we also want to provide something where you can just get up and running. So we've had GitHub Desktop for a long time, and we recently rolled out a new version, which is built on Electron. So now GitHub Desktop is open source. It's available on Electron. You can download it. You can run it as you always have been able to. But you can also hack on it. You can change it, fix things, make it work the way you want. Take it in a totally different direction with a fork if you want. Everyone, I think, here knows about open source. But we're really happy that GitHub Desktop is now available using Electron and is open source. And anyone can try it out today, modify it as you see fit, or just play with it as it comes, because it's a pretty great piece of software. And I've mentioned this a few times. Um, we have a platform called Electron. Has anyone ever built an app on Electron? A couple people? OK, cool. Yes, right? Yeah, Whistle. It's amazing. So Electron, uh, I don't want to get too into it, but it's a platform for building desktop applications. And you use web technologies to do it. So you basically make desktop apps as web pages, but they run locally. So you have access to the hard drive. You have access to any of the local operations you really want. And uh, even better than that, it runs cross-platform. So like there was this write once, run anywhere dream that I don't want to bring anyone back to any bad memories of their Java days. Uh, not, not Java today, but Java like 15 years ago. Electron is actually trying to do that, and it's kind of working. Is we have a lot of companies now that are building applications like a Slack or even Microsoft. And with Electron, these applications run on Windows, Mac, or Linux pretty much out of the box. That's amazing. Um, but the other thing we're seeing is a lot of companies now are using Electron to build internal apps. And I think for us, uh, in our position as GitHub, we see a lot of companies in a unique way. We see how they're using GitHub and what they're building software with. And a lot of times, that turns into a cool open source library or a cool piece of technology, some of which we're going to talk about later today. But um, sometimes that turns into novel uses or things we didn't really imagine or anticipate. And I think it's pretty fair to say that Electron is surprising us in, in many ways as well, whereas GitHub's growth and Atom's growth were surprises to us. but you know, we hope people are using Atom to write software. That's always been the plan. What people are using Electron for is really surprising us, and it's really amazing. And so we are seeing big Fortune 500 companies that are using Electron as a platform for writing internal applications. And they're increasingly having software developers build bespoke software for the company, for the way that they work internally. And a lot of that's in a web app. A lot of that's mobile apps. I'm sure a lot of us have interacted or even worked on stuff like that. But more and more, we're seeing a lot of these applications being built as native desktop applications using Electron. And that's, that's awesome. We're, we're really happy about that. Anything that gets people building more software, uh, collaborating more, we're really thrilled with. And to see Electron as a way for companies to write their own internal software that runs on the web or as a desktop application, that's really cool. Um, we have Electron Conf coming soon in July in Seattle. So you can Google it. If you're going to be in the US, you should check it out. Um, otherwise, you can find the talks. You can find out a lot of what's going on there. Um, it's going to be the first one we've done. We're pretty excited about it. So you know, please attend if you can. But if not, there's going to be a lot of great content related to Electron coming out of that in July. All right, so we're going to go back in time now and talk about GitHub as a platform. Um, we've always had a hard time describing GitHub, because the very basics, it's like a company and it's a website, and it's a community, and you can just go on and on and on. Um, and so someone's like, what is GitHub? 
And you kind of have to ask them, like, well, what do you know, right? And you're almost like negotiating in a way. But like, what do you think GitHub is? And then I can explain to you what I think GitHub is. And it's not a great place to be. But one of the things that's been sort of consistent for us, and I think for a lot of y'all, is GitHub is a platform. GitHub is a place where you can build things on top of it. And that started really on March 12, 2008. So this was about a month before the official launch of GitHub itself. And this is when we rolled out our first version of our REST API. Um, this, is not pretty, this is not very cutting edge or anything like that, but you know, websites have APIs and you build things on top of them. The reason we did that was because we are a website and we want people to build things on top of it, but we also want people to extend GitHub, to build additions to GitHub, to build plugins and just do weird stuff with it, but also productive stuff with it. So right away we had the API available, but um, it wasn't as good as it is today, which, which we'll talk about in a minute. But, even still, um, GitHub itself launched uh, in April 2008, so the API was available for the official launch, and then we kept working on the API in the early days, and obviously it's not as exciting as the fork queue or some of the new pull request stuff that was happening if you go and look at the old blog posts, but there was a lot of work that was being done on the API um, that was a little bit less glamorous, but was getting a lot of adoption. And one of the things we did really early on was we introduced webhooks to the site. And so this is, if you haven't used it, basically you can give us a, a URL and when an event happens on GitHub, we'll do a post request to the URL and we'll slam it with a bunch of data, JSON data, and you can do whatever you want with that. So you can run, um, you can build something, you can run a test, you can update your website, you can deploy, this and that. So we've had this for a long time, but one of the things we did with the Webhooks API was we made our own Webhooks open source. And so GitHub itself, as you probably know if you've tried to look for it, GitHub itself is not open source. But a lot of our libraries are, a lot of the things that we rely on are open source. And one of the things that's been open source since, since uh, April 29th, 2008, according to the, the words on the screen, are the Webhooks. And so if you wanted to add a Travis CI webhook or a Weebly webhook or a Shopify webhook or something like that, you could have done it yourself or you could have gone to the webhooks source code that we host and changed it and made a pull request. And so most of the branded webhooks that have been available on GitHub for the past nine years were created by you or contributed by the community. And we've always thought that was a really cool thing and sort of like um, not something that we glamorize or talk about a lot, but Obviously, it helped us because we can't possibly know all the webhooks and we don't spend all the time creating them. But we also thought it was just a cool way to interact with people and get a little bit more um, openness into the system. Now, there were some issues with the API and the webhooks at the time. Uh, the first version of the API, does anyone remember this? We only did 200 status codes. So if there was an error, you like the status code was part of the JSON of what it should have been, but the actual header was 200. Some people didn't mind. Other people wrote really mean emails to us. Um, I'll never forget it. But it was true, and we fixed it later. But the, the API was a little rough at the beginning. Um, this is also actually where it started. We didn't roll out a full-on GitHub API, which is how I've convinced myself we did do it. But when we look at the actual truth, uh, that's not what happened. What happened was we only rolled out commit API at the beginning. And so um, this is interesting because I think it really makes a statement that the, how we envision people building on top of GitHub was getting access to the Git data. We wanted people to get access to the code. That was our first priority. And I don't remember this as being controversial or us not listening to feedback. I think this was the feedback, is people didn't really want the OAuth and um, the user data on day one. Of course, people wanted that eventually. What they wanted on day one was access to their code, access to their data, and that's what we gave them. And so we really just started with two endpoints. Furthermore, uh, we started with JSON, of course. We had XML, believe it or not, and YAML. I don't know if anyone uh, remembers YAML. We actually had YAML endpoints available for the API. So uh, we were kind of just doing whatever to get people the data without a lot of, um, let's say, philosophy behind it. And there was one page of documentation, and um, page might be generous. I use really big fonts and double space things. But there wasn't a lot around there. So that's where we were in 2008. Now fast forward maybe four, five, six years, and Travis CI starts the private data in August 2012, and I'm sure you can talk to anyone from Travis here. Things did not advance dramatically between 2008 and 2012. There were still a lot of issues with the API. There, it, was, it wasn't extremely mature. It wasn't our first priority. It wasn't our first order of business. We were very much in a reactive mode around the API, and I mean, we didn't if we only serve 200 status codes, you can just imagine the, the level of quality that went into it. We cared, but it wasn't our first priority. So Travis starts building a business 
based on this API in 2012, so four years later. And this for us was a real, real big moment because we started to almost realize that this is more than just building scripts and one-offs and hacks and convenience things on top of the API. People really wanted more agency over their data. They really wanted to interact with it a lot more. And the other side of that is people could actually build companies on top of this thing. You can actually create services that work really well with GitHub, and that could be a business on its own. And that's, that's really amazing opportunity. Um, and that's really cool for us to be a part of that. So today, where we've gone in the time since that is we've spent a lot of time on the API. We've had a lot of improvements to it. We have things now like a, a dedicated API blog. We have a really cool pre-release feature. Um, but I think there's a lot more we can be doing. And one of the things that's really interesting today about the API, I was talking to someone last night um, who, who works at a, a big tech company. And they asked me, like, how many databases does, does GitHub use? And what is our sharding configuration? And I think if you talk to anyone on the infrastructure team at GitHub, you'll quickly realize that our biggest problem isn't really the web traffic or the users. Um, a lot of that isn't massive. What, what's really massive about GitHub is the data and the pooling and the cloning. And that's really where our scaling issues arise. And that's really, really where we spend a lot of our engineering effort and time is making the data available. And one way to see that is just through the, the frequency of Git clones and the traffic that we send just through the Git protocol. But this is another way to see that, too, is we actually get more traffic to our API, to our REST API, than we get to our website. And I don't know that that's um, a thing that a lot of big companies have to experience, but we do. So more and more, our API is becoming, for us, not a thing that we want to roll out with only 200 status codes, but a thing that is, for a lot of companies and a lot of scripts and a lot of tools, it's their version of GitHub. If I ask a robot that's accessing GitHub 100 times a day, what is GitHub to you? To that robot, it's an API, right? And that's silly. But to the human who's writing that robot, they look at the GitHub API maybe more than they actually look at the GitHub website. So this is actually very interesting data for us. And it's a different way for us to think about how we drive the product and how we drive the community for you all. Because like, you're using our API more than you're using our website. We care deeply about the website. But we should also care deeply about the API and really look at how you're using it, what are you not getting today, and what can we add? So the other side of this is over 5 million people on GitHub are using integration. And so integration is our word for anything that plugs into GitHub, like a Travis or a Slack. It has some sort of official or unofficial way of interacting with the API or driving GitHub.com. So over 5 million people are involved in a team or something that uses an integration today, which is just a massive number. And OAuth usage on GitHub itself, it's doubling every year. I don't know if you can see that from this graph, but it says it in the words, so you can take my word for it. But every year, OAuth usage is doubling. So more and more people are authenticating against these integrations or are using these different tools that are built on top of GitHub. So it's becoming a very real deal. And then overall, 60% of teams on GitHub use one or more integrations that we know about. And we think this number is actually bigger because they're using tools that interact with GitHub that maybe we don't have an OAuth connection to or something like that. So the problem is. Um, as we have begun evolving, as we've begun thinking more about APIs and data and you know, fancy things like that, um, the APIs themselves haven't really evolved. There hasn't been a ton of progress in this area since GitHub was created. Um, you know, it's still easier today in many ways to set up a lot of this stuff on your own. Yeah, there is a GitHub API and there's an um, integrations directory, but a lot of us, our workflows, our tools, we've glued them together. We've written these scripts against the GitHub API. And this, like, there's no real assumption that this is the way you're going to be working, but it is the way you're working. And so we have to do a lot of the work to set up these things. And actually, this has turned into a very powerful way to use GitHub, is we have a lot of companies and customers that are building integrations on top of GitHub, and they're open sourcing these plugins and things like that. And that's really great. But it's, there's a lot of meta work around getting these things up and running that we just see as totally unnecessary. So even despite all this growth and the API being the main way people interact with the site, it's still not a great experience. So we're seeing this, this, sur this surge of traffic but like, kind of in spite of it, we're not doing anything to help make that easy. So it's hard to find these tools. Um, everyone knows there are a 1,000 tools that work really well with GitHub, but there's, there's no way to find them or set them up or use them together. Um, and then OAuth itself, it's really all or nothing. Um, OAuth was designed, it's, it's a great piece of technology, but it was designed for people to authenticate with a social network. And the, the, the biggest like, chunk of 
private data that we were really talking about when OAuth was defined was like your friends list or something that you've said in private. Now we're talking about your code. We're talking about your business data. We're talking about your, your future and your livelihood or just like, I don't know, uh, that crappy Python script that you read that you wrote that you don't want him to see. Like very private, very personal stuff, right? Um, and so OAuth really needs, we need more of it and we need to ask more of it and give back more to it. But we need something that can think about the problems of today and not the problems that, let's say, a social network had 10 years ago. And the other side of it are, um, does anyone remember any of these technologies? Anyone use SOAP? I'm sorry, I didn't want to make, start this off on like a negative note. But uh, there's been a lot of different cycles through like holy grail API technology. And um, I, I've only seen a couple of them myself, but I, I got to use SOAP a little bit when I first started out as an engineer. Um, I luckily avoided XML RPC. I'm sorry to anyone that didn't. And then I loved REST. I, I grew up as a Ruby on Rails developer. I started using Rails right when it came out. And Rails really promoted REST APIs and this way of thinking about the web. And I was, I was super into that, especially coming from SOAP. REST was very clear. It was very appealing to me. And even though I got introduced to it through Rails and the Rails community, it seemed like a web technology. I didn't feel like it was a Ruby technology, although now maybe I feel differently. Um, but at the time, it really seemed like this was a web technology that Ruby was embracing. And so I knew that my, my colleagues and my peers using Python or Perl or anything, I was hoping that they would also be using REST in a similar way. And it would sort of not matter anymore what technologies and libraries we use. That would fade into the background. So I was a huge fan of REST. But that was 12 years ago. Right? REST has been here for a while. Um, and it's gotten us very far. But I think similar to OAuth, there are a lot of things that are different about the world. And a lot of the context that REST was created in and imagined in, it's changed. Um, it's different now. The, the world is different. I don't think that when REST was created, there were major websites that were mostly hit through their API. Like, this is not the world we were envisioning when we created REST. What we were thinking about, I'm saying we, I had no part in it. But when we were creating REST, what we were thinking about was access to your data, actually taking the HTTP protocol seriously, stateless communication. These were the things. Not a website like GitHub that's handling major data that has a huge development team that's building software that you're also building software against that's changing all the time. This is just not the concerns that REST had. So we're thinking about all these things sort of coming together. Uh, you know, our API is soaring in usage. We're seeing companies like Travis, but tons more, build their own businesses on top of GitHub. Um, our own frustrations, frankly, in trying to juggle between all these different applications that plug into GitHub. And then at the end of the day, REST is um, it's, it's dead technology. It's not over, but it's dated. I think the cycle is ending, and we're ready for something new. The world is ready for a new way to talk about APIs, a new way to interchange data, and something that needs to be focused on developers. And this is really the idea behind GitHub, is GitHub was created for developers. It was created by developers. I'm sure you've heard that before. I've said it already today. But ultimately, a lot of what we wanted to do with GitHub was build something that you wanted to use. And so when we think about the future of our API, that's exactly how we're thinking of it. SOAP and XMLRPC and REST were really powerful for moving our mindset and a lot of our boss's mindset to allow us to make this data open, to allow us to spend time building an API, to allow us to share this stuff with the world. And that was a hurdle, because we wanted to do it. A lot of us developers wanted to do it, but we had to convince the manager it was a good idea. SOAP really helped with that, and REST really helped with that. And the prevalence of APIs and a lot of this open data economy, these memes, these ideas, these buzzwords, they got people thinking in this direction. And that's over now. I think the APIs have won. There's, it's not controversial anymore. And so now we're in a world where it's the, by default we want to start developing with open APIs and sharing this data, but like, is this the best tool? Are these API development tools now built to by developers for developers? We've convinced your boss and my boss and me that we should be sharing data, but like, are you doing it in the best way possible? Are the tools built for you? Are the tools built by you? And the answer is no, REST is not that. REST is trying to salvage the HTTP protocol, which is ancient, and turn it into something that we can really use well. It's not rethought with the context of today with the problems that we have today. So what we're going to talk about today are uh, our ideas about the future of APIs, the future of REST, uh, the future of working together. And so I'd like to bring to the stage Mr. Kyle Daigle uh, at GitHub, who's going to talk a little bit about some of the new things we're doing and some of our opinions on the future of APIs, a lot of which I think you'd be really interested to hear about. So please join me in welcoming Kyle to the stage. <laughs> 
Hey everybody, I am super excited to be here. Uh, GitHub's the best platform to collaborate on software, build tools, find the best tools for your workflow. Uh, and I really think what we're up to and what we're gonna talk about today is going to be what you all have done. You all built tools, you've built integrations, you've extended our platform. Like Chris said, the API that we have right now is nine years old. Uh, you've all worked with it, you felt the joys of using it, you felt the pains of using it. Uh, you've been limited sometimes in what you can do. We think an open ecosystem is the best way to move forward. Let you build your best workflow, find your best workflow using an extremely powerful platform. And so I'm gonna talk about three things today that we're releasing that are gonna help you do that. The first one is GraphQL. We released an early access for GraphQL at GitHub Universe last year, and we gave the community a new way to get at data. Uh, it's a technology that Facebook created and open sourced, and it allows you to build a query, get exactly the data that you need, and get a response in the same exact shape of that, of that data. The important thing is that GitHub has changed how we build features to make this possible. Now at GitHub, when we build a new feature for github.com or GitHub Enterprise, we first build a GraphQL API, and then we consume that ourselves. That's a big change to the way we used to work, like Chris mentioned, where if anyone has built a REST API before, you build a feature usually, then you go, oh, I need to build an API for this, you build an API, and inevitably they get out of sync. GraphQL helps us fix that. So just a quick example. On the left, you'll see a simple GraphQL query saying I wanna know who I am, I want the login and the bio, and on the right, you get back structured data that looks basically the same. And this is powering all of our new features at GitHub and externally as well, as our integrators are starting to adopt this during the early access. I'd like to walk you through a couple of features that are powered in part by GraphQL on GitHub. Some of you might have seen the new code review features, including uh, suggested reviewers. Uh, allows you to choose someone that you think you'd like them to review your code. This is backed by GraphQL. Projects, our new project board that launched at GitHub Universe last year. This is also backed by GraphQL. A little bit of a meta fact, uh, the REST API is actually backed by GraphQL itself for the project's API. So when we say we're building everything on GraphQL, we mean we're building the old API on GraphQL, we're building the features on GraphQL. Everything's powered by this new layer on our platform. And finally, uh, we have Atom, or excuse me, Topics. And with Topics, we allow you to choose different keywords that allow you to uh, say what this repository is about, is about, and let you find different repositories within your organization or across all of GitHub uh, that have those topics. And with that, now Topics is 100% built from scratch from GraphQL. And so we are committing to changing the way we're building GitHub to allow you to have the same exact power as our own internal engineers. Right now, since we released the early access, we're doing 125 million GraphQL queries per day. A lot of that is internally, so we're, when we're using GraphQL, uh, that's a lot of these queries, but it's also through our early access, and we've seen integrators join us and build new features. But like Chris said, part of the ecosystem is on desktop, and last week we released the Atom package uh, that had Git and GitHub integration. These features and tools are all powered by GraphQL, and the package is open source. So if you'd like to go and change the way that we show the pull requests now in this package, it's using open GraphQL APIs that you can use. There's no secret sauce. There's nothing that we're keeping from you in order to build the best integration. During early access, we've been working with a variety of integrators, but one of those has been Heroku. On the dashboard page, now when you look at your uh, Heroku pipeline, you can see the statuses of all your builds. And they reached out because they said, we couldn't give this feature to our users and we wanted to, because the REST API made so many calls necessary to get at this data. With GraphQL, we can make one call and ship a feature to production. And so this is live now, powered by our GraphQL API. So the exciting news today is now GraphQL is production ready. So if you've been waiting to join the bandwagon from the early access, you can join in and know that we're committed to a platform that we're gonna work with you, we're gonna code with you, uh, we're gonna build alongside each other uh, as we use this new API. At GitHub Universe last year, we also did an early access for integrations, uh, now called GitHub Apps. With GitHub Apps, uh, we're trying to solve a problem that Chris mentioned with OAuth. The API is nine years old, been using OAuth. OAuth doesn't really work for most businesses. 
If you're someone using our new business plan, or if you're an organization that wants to protect some of your data, it's an all or nothing. You can't use OAuth most of the time because you don't want to give the keys to the kingdom to everyone. GitHub ourselves, we can't use our integrators. We can't use the tools they build. We love them, but we can't use them. In a few cases, we have to write custom code because we're uncomfortable granting OAuth. So we know we needed to fix this. With GitHub Apps, we allow you to choose just the repositories that you want, and then much more fine-grained permissions than we ever offered you before. And so we enable options like, I would just like you to read this code, or I would just like you to have read access to issues, or down to a single file. So for integrators that have a metadata file and you just want to get to uh, the heroku.yaml file, you can ask for a permission just for that one file. We're letting the customers choose how they want to give access and making it more likely for integrators to have success reaching those customers. When you install, no longer does your entire organization have to get that super scary screen that says, this integration would like to access everything that you have underneath it. And people don't normally click that. Uh, with GitHub Apps, once you install it, it's installed once, and everyone can use it with a simple screen that basically says, your organization has allowed this, go ahead and use it. We've seen a lot of bot usage, both at GitHub and outside of GitHub over the years. And now with GitHub Apps, we're going to make it a lot easier for integrators to act as themselves. If you've used OAuth and you've used an integration, a lot of times the integration will completely act as some random employee in your organization. And that's usually the person that installed the integration. And so with this, we're going to allow the bot itself to take actions. It can make comments. It can change and create issues. It can do whatever it needs to. Uh, in order to be clear that this is an integration that you're using, but also allow you to act on your own behalf. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Since we put this into early access, we've noticed a huge uptick in the number of people that are actually using integrations. Because it's so much easier to install and you feel a lot safer. And so you'll see we have over 100,000 users using this, and some very large organizations across the 5,000 organizations that have joined during the early access into the, in the period that we very clearly said, please don't use this in production. The demand was so high that they used it anyway, and it's been very successful. One of our uh, integration partners, Waffle, uh, is very excited about this. One of the things that uh, inevitably comes up, especially in project management apps, where you have both developers, project managers, designers, lots of people collaborating, uh, how it'll be much easier for them in order to get everyone working in one place using their project management tool. So I'm excited to announce that now this is production ready as well. So now you can go ahead and build together with GraphQL and GitHub Apps to have the most powerful platform that GitHub has ever offered. The, th the thing that I'm most excited about, to be honest, is that we've changed a lot of the ways that we work, so that way you can build with us. But sometimes you don't want to build. A very common thing as a developer myself is you end up in a situation where you think that you have the best answer, and you go off and you create a side project, and then you realize, oh, there's an open source library. Or you go and set up an open source tool, and you realize, oh, there's a better tool that we can offer you. We think that we have a better solution for this, so that if you want to build with us, you can. But if you want to just get something that's going to be perfect for your team and workflow, you can do that. And so today, we're launching GitHub Marketplace. This is GitHub Marketplace. It allows you to find the tools that'll fit your workflow best. And very easily find a plan that works for you, click it and buy it using your GitHub account, have it set up in minutes. So no longer do you have to go and find the right tools or make sure that you know the right tools or go on a bunch of news sites to find out what's the cool new thing. You don't have to go find someone in your organization that has the credit card that you can use. If you're an administrator in the organization, you can buy an integration, get it installed, and let your developers take advantage of the tools that our integrators have already built for you. So I want to show you the process in buying one of these. I'm going to show you Rollbar, a really cool error monitoring and tracking tool that can do real-time updates. This is their listing that they put together and listed in our marketplace for launch. We offer a variety of plans uh, that the integrators choose and set up by themselves. And so I think that we need the bootstrap plan, and so I can choose that, and then very quickly have all those features in a simple uh, purchase flow. If I'm an organizational admin, I can buy it and have it set up very quickly. For our launch, we have four categories. 
uh, in the monitoring category, we're talking about monitoring code changes. Uh, we want to measure performance, track errors, and sometimes analyze your application. Uh, this is one of the more popular uh, areas in which we think people need this sort of tool. So we have Sentry, Blackfire, and Rollbar. In project management, it's all about automating code review. Or, excuse me. Um, in, uh, <laughs> in code quality, it's all about automating code review, uh, testing the style, quality, the security. With that, we have CodeCov, Codacy, and CodeBeat. And in project management, if you don't want to use our projects tool, if you don't want to use issues, you can find the tool that works best for you, uh, including ZenHub, Waffle, CodeTree, and Zoob. And then finally, continuous integration. Run your tests easily and quickly. You can get it set up by purchasing Travis, CircleCI, AppVair, or Percy, which is a very cool uh, visual testing and review tool. So if you're a designer, I definitely think you should check that tool out. And if you are an integrator, or if you hear about what we're offering today with our platform and you think now's the time to join in, you can join our marketplace. You can come in, you can get your app listed in the, uh, one of the most vibrant ecosystems that are out there to our 21 million developers. The app will have seamless integration. We'll handle getting you the audience that you need to make sure you can find the customers that are right for you, make it easy to click buy and install. And then you can find out how to focus just on the thing that makes you unique and not have to focus on all the other parts of building a business around your integration. You can find more details about this at github.com slash marketplace, and you can apply today. With GraphQL, GitHub Apps, and Marketplace, we've created the most powerful platform yet. Uh, whether you're using our GraphQL API, which allows you to make one call to get all the data that you need, uh, whether you're installing a new integration using GitHub Apps, which lets you just install where you want it with just the permissions that you need, or finding and buying the ideal continuous integration workflow in our marketplace. We're very excited to work together on this by using the same tools as you and offering you the changes and improvements and updates that we make to our own platform that we need to build github.com to offer it to you customers, to developers, to businesses, and to our integrators uh, to see where we're all gonna go together. I'd like to show you a video that we made for Marketplace. Uh, thank you so much. When developers want to find the best tool for the job, or the tool that takes them to the next step, they've always come to the same place. Introducing GitHub Marketplace. Get the tools you need to do your best work with the largest community of developers on Earth. It isn't really a new idea. It's just a really good idea. Find out more at github.com slash marketplace. Hello again. Cool, huh? So uh, I just want to say thank you again to the teams for everything they launched today. I hope you're excited about it. Please check out GraphQL, the Marketplace, GitHub Apps. You know, I've uh, told this story a million times, so I'm not going to bore you, but we didn't start GitHub as a company. We started GitHub as a side project because we were doing other companies, but it was really just for ourselves. It was a product. It was a piece of software that we wanted to use to collaborate on Git. And when we saw how it affected people, when we saw how obsessed we were with it, when we saw what people wanted to do with it, that's when we decided this could be a real thing, this could be a real company, and we've got to figure out some way to make money. But like, this could be something interesting. And that's where the company started. 
GitHub now is nine years old. We're going on to be a decade. We're growing. We have a lot more people. We have a lot more interests. We're all over the world. But that sort of sentiment, that idea of we're building things for the community, with the community, for developers, by developers, that's becoming stronger than ever for us. And as we become a big company, we're not losing sight of that. We're actually betting everything on that. So the future of GitHub and what we're launching today and what this represents is about a future that we're building together. Like We're excited about the marketplace because we're excited about what you're going to build inside of it and what we're going to put inside of it too. We're excited about the future of GitHub because we're excited to see what you're going to build and what you're going to do. And the only reason we're here today, the only reason I'm on stage, the only reason GitHub Satellite is possible is because of you. It's because of what you've built, what you've put on GitHub, what you've shared with the world, how your company's built software. GitHub is in itself a pretty cool thing, but ultimately the GitHub community the software development community, that's the real rise, that's the real amazing thing, that's what these numbers represent. So we're not just taking advantage of this and sort of saying we know best and we're just going to run with it. We're saying let's talk, let's do this together. We want to build software with you. We're using the same APIs that we're building internally, we're making them available to you. The same way we're building projects and features internally, we're making them available to you. We're here, we want to talk, we've got the community staff, we've got developers, we've got salespeople. We want to build GitHub with all of you. And this is not just something that we're doing because we feel like we need to give back, because we do feel like that. This is what we think is the future of software development. We believe in an open ecosystem, we believe in a diverse and inclusive ecosystem, and we think the future is a lot of smart people working together, not against each other, not to reinvent the wheel, but to solve real problems and just forget about all the crap that gets in your way. So thank you again for coming to Satellite. Thank you for everyone who's putting on this event. I hope you'll help us. I hope you'll be there with us. But I mean, you already are. You're here. You're sitting here. You put software on GitHub. You've contributed. We've worked together. We believe that this is the future. And these numbers, these are just proof points. And so we're really excited to see what people build on Marketplace, what people build with GraphQL. But we're not worried. We know it's going to be amazing because we've done nothing but be amazed so far over the past 10 years by what all you have done. So we want to figure out what you're going to do next. We want to figure out how we can make it possible. So thank you again to everyone. Please check out the marketplace. Check out GraphQL. Let us know what you're building. We want to help make it great. Talk to us. And please enjoy Satellite. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a great conference. Thanks.